Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Energy 101. We are stoked today because we finally have a nuclear 101. Something that's been coming up on our radar a lot recently. Um, and we have John Chaplin here from Last Energy to school us on nuclear. John, welcome. Thank you guys for inviting me. Glad to be here. Of course. So I will say we okay. have like two firsts today. This is our first. We've never done a virtual podcast. Mm -hmm. So you're our first virtual okay. podcast as well as nuclear. So yeah, we're pumped. Awesome. Perfect. Well, glad to be a first in two different ways. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So do you want to um, give us a quick background on yourself, how you got into energy in general, um, maybe specifically how your career led you to last energy? Sure, sure. So yeah, my career really started off uh, actually in oil and gas. So mm. I, I'm originally from Houston, went to school Perfect. at University of Texas and studied economics. Uh, and then joined uh, investment banking and worked in the investment banking industry in Houston for about seven years. So mainly focused on oil and gas M&A, uh, particularly with kind of the shale development mm -hmm. in the 2013 to 2019 era. Um, and then since then, I've kind of left uh, after a few different downturns in the oil and gas industry, <laughs> decided that I wanted to, you know, explore other avenues, started working at startups in Austin. Uh, and then through kind of working through those startups, came across Last Energy as really an interesting thesis on the nuclear space mm -hmm. and an interesting kind of development model and brought my kind of experience and expertise in energy private equity markets uh, to bear kind of being able to finance these projects. I love that. You're the perfect person then to speak to us on um, learning about nuclear because we all are familiar with oil and gas. I would say probably most of our listeners mm -hmm. are in the mm -hmm. oil and gas space. Um, so yeah, you can uh, really speak the language to us <laughs> where it makes sense. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the oil and gas space was a great space to get started. I mean, at mm -hmm. the time, that was probably the most active, you know, segment of the energy markets. Uh, and it was really a place to, you know, cut your teeth and understand what was an attractive investment and how to really do a, a really technical evaluation of a company. Yeah. That reminds me of the course that we're <laughs> in process. We're yeah. in process of putting out a course that's evaluating oil and gas deals. So um, that's kind of right up, right up okay. that alley. But let's dive in. So pretend you are explaining nuclear energy to a kindergartner. What uh -huh. is nuclear energy? Well, I guess I'd probably start off with just explaining a power plant. So okay, yeah, you know, let's most start there. power plants that are out there uh, run off what's called a, a steam Rankine cycle. So essentially it is some energy source is heating up water and producing steam. That steam is then piped to a turbine that spins and generates electricity. Um, and and that's really how most power plants uh, that are out there exist today. And it's just depending on what is that energy source that they're using. Are they mm -hmm. using coal? Are they using natural gas? Are they using biomass? Or are they using nuclear energy? Um, so then if that's what a normal power plant looks like, how is a nuclear energy power plant different? It's really just about how it generates that heat source. Mm -hmm. So in a coal or natural gas fired power plant, you're taking that coal, you're burning it, it's producing heat and it's heating up that water. In a nuclear power plant, really all you're doing is taking uranium and facilitating a nuclear uh, kind of reaction to basically have that uranium generate heat that then heats up water to create that steam. How common right now are nuclear power plants? So there's about 400 or so nuclear reactors that are operating globally. Not all of those are power plants. Some of uh, many of them are actually research reactors or reactors oh, okay. that are put at universities to help train hmm. uh, future nuclear engineers. So, for example, there is a, a research reactor that is at Texas A&M University, hmm. um, just north of Houston, uh, that is oh, used to kind of train nuclear operators. Um, but yeah, globally around 400 or a little more than 400 reactors. Do you know how many are in the U.S.? Not off the top of my head. Uh, it's probably a large percentage of them, uh, mm -hmm. especially if you include uh, like the Navy nuclear fleet mm -hmm. or a lot of the nuclear reactors that are in like the uh, aircraft carriers 
Uh, there's a lot of the research reactors are here. And then we also have uh, quite a bit of nuclear power plants as well. Got it. Can you explain fission and fusion? Those always come up when you're talking about nuclear. Can you explain mm -hmm. like what it is at a high level? Yeah, at the highest level, uh, and you know, being a finance guy, I can't really go into <laughs> too much details. But at the highest level, really, fission is you know about basically taking um, the atoms and being able to a, a little bit uh, ki kind of basically split them apart mm -hmm. and creating energy from doing that. And fusion is really pushing them together, uh, and sense. that requires an immense amount of energy. And that's why it's really on the cutting edge of where nuclear is going. Uh, what you want to do is be able to create a lot of energy, fuse those, uh, you know, those electrons together or those uh, atoms together and be able to have that create an abundance of energy that you can then use to produce, you know, electricity. So is that essentially like how nuclear energy is getting generated? Or is that completely uh, separate? That's how it generates the heat that then got it. it. Okay, that creates the steam that then creates the electricity. And so the, it is one of the benefits of nuclear energy is that that is what it is doing. It is uh, creating heat. So if you need heat, you can use nuclear energy just for steam. So for mm -hmm. like district heating or using heating in your industrial processes, uh, or you can take that heat and use it to generate electricity using kind of a standard power plant design. Got it. And so the fission fusion process, is that happening with uranium or where does the, like uranium come in to the mix? Like where I don't know <laughs> if this is like too deep into it. I don't know what questions are like, you know, um, don't make sense. <laughs> yeah, I know what with, with the fusion, I think. I think there are other elements that you can use. Uranium is by far the, the one that's used the most. Gotcha. Um, and, and that's kind of the standard. Uh, I okay. think there are there there are people doing research to figure out maybe other elements that can be used. Right. Um, but yeah, typically when you're looking at a you know fission reactor, it is using uranium uh, U U two three five, um, and you basically can get that uranium from a ton of different sources. And then there's some enrichment level to uh, enrich that uranium to be able to use it in um, a nuclear power plant setting. What, why would someone use nuclear power at a plant as opposed to like a natural gas? Obviously, all of us know that mm -hmm. coal emissions, the environment, coal is like a big no no these mm -hmm. days. So, what's what, how does like that compare to nuclear and why people would move in that direction? So, I, th I think there's a couple advantages in nuclear when comparing it to coal or even natural gas. You know, there, there's a big decarbonization push across mm -hmm. really the globe. So a lot of the customers that we're targeting are focused on decarbonizing their energy mix. So one of the countries that we're very focused on is is Poland at Last Energy. Um, and they get 80% of their power from coal. So they want to transition that away. They were in, initially looking at transitioning to natural gas. But obviously, the problem with natural gas is that you're reliant on natural gas supply to be able right. to fuel that uh, power plant. And with the Ukraine uh, war, that ended up becoming a bigger problem. So they started to make a pivot and decide to explore nuclear energy as an opportunity. So being a finance guy, one of the biggest drawbacks to nuclear is how expensive it is to get started. Can you kind mm -hmm. of explain that and um, maybe compare it to like oil and gas, if you're able, if there is a comparison there? Um, because I know that sure. is one of the biggest, like, why we aren't more, like, using nuclear more is just because of how expensive it is to get started and the timeline, I think, um, mm -hmm. of building a new reactor plant. I don't know what they're called. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, 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 no, that's true. And that's that's the biggest critique that we see, you know, from people when we're talking in the market. And we've developed a very unique thesis at Last Energy around that. Uh, and I can draw some comparisons to what that would be in oil and gas. But essentially what happened in the nuclear space is that it really got started in the 60s, kind of post-World War II, after kind of development of nuclear energy as a source. And from the 60s to, let's say, the, the back end of the 80s was really when it went from, you know, no nuclear power plants to all the way up to 400. And since then, it's kind of remained at that level. 
Mm. Uh, and the really reason being is the large regulatory burden that is added to nuclear power plants. There's a lot of safety analysis. There's a lot of development right. and mm -hmm. kind of corp uh, or, um, you know, government led regulatory uh, that you need to go through regulatory processes. Um, so as we kind of that kind of scaled up through uh, the 60s through the 80s, what the nuclear energy focused on was we're going to try to get economies of scale by making these plants larger and larger and larger. Uh, and they got up to, you know, gigawatt scale facilities. Once they started doing that, though, they limited the people they could sell to. So they could only really sell to a utility and really a utility with a government backing it because it was such a large project. And the best example that, you know, if you wanted to draw a comparison to oil and gas would be these large offshore mm -hmm. projects that, you know, they don't really require as much regulatory oversight as a nuclear plant, but it's definitely more regulatory oversight compared to, let's say, like an onshore shale development. Right. Um, and what Last Energy has done is said, let's actually scale that back down to a much, much smaller level, widen the market that we can sell to. Um, and then also, since we're scaling it down, we've uh, lowered the regulatory burden that we have to mm. go through because it's not such a large plant. So hopefully we're able to proceed through a project much, much quicker. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Are there any other, other than the financial aspect, are there any other kind of roadblocks you see when talking about the benefits of nuclear and trying to maybe get people to make that switch? I could imagine people that maybe aren't familiar with the ins and outs hear the word nuclear, kind of like they hear the word oil and gas um, and think everything is bad. Are people kind of scared of the term nuclear? A little bit, though, I will say of the last several years, we've seen that change, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think. If you were to ask that question three, four years ago, yep. <laughs> I think most people would have a knee-jerk reaction that yeah. nuclear is unsafe, it's too expensive, it takes too long to develop, we shouldn't even consider it. Um, and we're definitely starting to see across all of our markets and globally that that uh, mindset is changing. I do think that it, it might be changing at the energy or government level, at the mm -hmm. local level, talking to communities where you might develop uh, nuclear energy is still a scary word that people are always worried about, but um, really just explaining how safe it is. And from an energy source perspective, you know, oil and gas, coal, it is, has much more accidents, has many more deaths attributed to it hmm. compared to what nuclear energy has. How do, how do climate activists take to um, nuclear because I know like whenever you see a nuclear reactor and you see the steam coming out of it, a lot of people think that chemicals or whatever mm -hmm. being released, but it's really just steam. So it's not bad. For, it's actually like the I, I'm I love nuclear. I think it, there should be way more nuclear. Um, but yeah, I'm curious how climate activists feel about it. Do they love it or do they like are they not as educated there? Yeah, I, I would say that climate activists are kind of split on the issue. So okay. there, there's some, you know, very big climate activist organizations like Greenpeace kind of mm -hmm. comes to mind that is very anti-nuclear uh, and they do not want any nuclear developed anywhere. They're constantly they're one of the ones that really led for Germany to uh, shut down most of their you know nuclear reactors. So we definitely see some of big elements in the climate space really have a large pushback to nuclear. Mm -hmm. But I think there are certain advantages that, you know, the renewable energy sources like solar and wind are not able to meet. Right. So if mm -hmm. you were looking for a carbon free, really baseload power product, yeah. nuclear yeah. is really the only one that has shown to be developed uh, to be able to provide power, you know, in a safe, consistent manner. So I think there's a lot of government officials and people who are setting policy that are trying to make that turn to bring nuclear in as a lag of their energy mix. Right. And I mm -hmm. oh sorry, were you going to say something? Go ahead. Um, I know you mentioned with what Last Energy is doing, you guys are trying to scale it down a little bit, making it more accessible, easier to kind of push over the regulatory edge. Um, do you feel like as more people get on board with nuclear that as things develop overall pricing will come down and maybe that barrier to entry 
is a little lighter. So could, could we see, in your opinion, a lot more, I know you're working with Poland, a lot more countries um, switching to nuclear over the next, let's call it, I don't know, five years, five, 10 years? Yeah, absolutely. I, I would say that there's a lot of people operating, you know, the, uh, the nuclear industry doesn't really like to uh, title it this, but there's like a nuclear renaissance that's happening huh, okay. uh, right now where there's a lot of new entrants and also some of the existing kind of legacy operators that are all working on deploying uh, either at the gigawatt scale or what they're calling small modular reactors or SMRs. So these are these are much smaller than gigawatt scales to be able to deploy. Uh, a lot of the timelines are, you know, 2026 to uh, early 2030s for deployment. Mm -hmm. But I think as if those projects all get done, uh, you know, on time and on budget and there's enough interest to reinvest, what you will see is the cost come down the same that we saw with solar and wind. Right. Where early on those technologies, there wasn't a large supply chain to draw on. They were very expensive. Uh, but as they become more developed, more commercialized, the costs uh, considerably ramp down. Are there any other countries right now that are really leaning into nuclear? I would say so. Uh, Last Energy kind of started with a list of 30 countries that okay. we were considering. Uh, and we whittled that down to the four that we're in. So we're operating in Poland, Romania, Netherlands, and the UK. Uh, there's reasons for that. A lot of it has to do with economic and also right. the regulatory environment and them uh, having a positive view towards nuclear. But over the last several years with the Ukraine gas crisis, uh, we've seen a lot of inbounds from several other countries that have ha either had nuclear in mm -hmm. the past and uh, have, haven't have developed any new nuclear reactors or have never developed a nuclear reactor and are really looking to see if they can add this to the energy mix. So we get inbounds every week from countries all over the world wanting to know more about our technology, how we can come in and help stabilize the grid while still right. providing carbon-free power. Awesome. So I have a question. How is nuclear energy stored? Is it different than other types of energy? That might be a dumb question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess with so the uranium itself, after it's enriched, really stores all of that energy. And it's really just all about putting a moderator in there and then it kind of burns through uh, that. So it's, it's somewhat similar to, I guess, the way that you could think about energy storage as oil or gas, mm -hmm. but it's constantly running. Once mm -hmm. you kind of, you can moderate the nuclear reactor a bit with what are called control rods, which are basically these elements that will slow down the nuclear fission reaction. Um, but that heat is constantly generated and then you're mm -hmm. taking that steam uh, to generate that electricity. So with like a gas or a coal plant, you might just stop feeding it, you know, gas or coal. And with a nuclear yeah. plant, you would just put in the control rods to stop the uh, nuclear reaction. So is it pretty infinite? Would you say? I wouldn't say it's infinite. It does burn up the fuel. So you will use the fuel similar to the way that you would use the fuel for a gas or coal plant. Right. But it's much more energy dense. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, compared to gas or coal, it's multiple factors more dense than the energy that you can get out of those on a per, you know, like kilogram basis. So you're getting like more bang for your buck? Essentially. Yep. Yeah. I, I think I um there's a bunch of TikToks on nuclear energy and I find them fascinating. And one thing that I thought was cool was they would take a uranium pellet that's like this big and tell you like how much energy was mm -hmm. in that little pellet. And I think mm -hmm. that's energy density. Um, but no, that's that's really cool. Y'all should get on yeah. um, nuclear TikTok. It's <laughs> fascinating. I, prob I probably should. I don't have TikTok. But maybe, maybe I should. Uh, there, there are definitely comparisons. I think I've seen one. I, I might be misquoting it, but it's nuclear is generated roughly 10 percent of the United States electricity. And mm -hmm. you could take all of the waste of the fuel and it would only populate like a football field size uh, of wow. waste. So it's Spe not a lot that we're using to be able to generate that much electricity. Right. And speaking of the so once the nuclear fuel is used. Isn't there something like the waste that has to be buried or what What do you do with that? I don't know how to ask this question, <laughs> um, yeah. but there's something that you have to like bury or something, do something with. 
Can you? So explain? so it is. It's the it's the spent uranium that is the waste. Got and it. That uranium that is in there, it is still radioactive uh, mm. after you've used it, but maybe it can't generate the you know same amount of heat anymore. So what people will do will, uh, and it depends really on the regulatory environment and the country that you're mm. in, but there are different things that we could do. And not every country has to figure it out. Even the United States, you know, I, you guys might be familiar with Yucca Mountain was an idea that we would basically dig a hole in a mountain and store up all of our nuclear yeah. waste. <laughs> um, that ended up not really going anywhere. Uh, so now what a lot of plants in the United States do is they just keep the nuclear waste on site. Uh, but handling nuclear waste, is it's more of a, a perception that it's a scary problem, but when you really dive down into it, it's, it's not that scary. Uh, the way that we store waste now is we just take those nuclear fuel rods that have the uranium in it and really just encase it in cement uh, and like a steel structure. Mm -hmm. And you can walk up and touch those uh, once it's in that structure and, you know, you're not at risk of you know, any radiation poisoning. Got it. So it's really just uh, more of a perception problem than a, than a real actual physical problem. So what happens when you have like a, like a bunch of those? Do you just stack them on top of each other or like where do they go? Because I'm thinking about like wind, wind turbines, for mm -hmm. instance. Like there's mm -hmm. like wind turbine um graveyards graveyards, graveyards yeah. where there's yeah. just like it's terrible for the environment it's just like they don't there's nothing you can do with them and they're just out there so do they just sit there or what do they do for nuclear so they would just sit there uh we would propose to countries that we would want to reprocess the fuel and maybe oh. potentially re-enrich it and use it again. But it's really up to the countries on what they would like yeah. to do. So Got as it. the countries figure it out, they might say, we want you to put in a central repository. They might say that, that we want you to actually ship it back to where you got it from. Uh, so, you know, if we were to buy it in the United States, they'd ask us to ship it back to the United States and the United States would tell us what to do with it. But our preference actually would be to reprocess it uh, and reuse it. Speaking of, where do you buy the do, the uranium? They're like uranium dealers. <laughs> there are uranium dealers. So uranium is mined, uh, you know, very similar to where other natural resources are. The mining of uranium is uh, very much kind of centralized in a few countries. Russia, Kazakhstan are really the two biggest suppliers of uranium to the market. Um, and, and that's just uh, uranium that you can pull out of the ground. Right. Once you've pulled that uranium out of the ground, there are some processes that you have to do, uh, the main one being enrichment, to basically get it up to a level that it can be used in nuclear fuel. Uh, and those enrichment facilities are spread out across the world. The United States has some, um, as well as like other European nations. Um, and, and a lot of them have kind of gone dormant with nuclear reactors slowing down their build out, but the U.S. is considering restarting a lot of them as uh, even nuclear energy here in the United States is cool. being talked about as being a major lag. So let's talk about last energy. I know you've mentioned a few times you guys kind of have a different approach. Um, it mm -hmm. sounds like you guys are like changing the game um, in terms of how people have access to it. So feel free to jump in and talk on that. Sure. So yeah, I can give you the pitch. Uh, really, we were started by uh, our founder, Brett Kugelmoss, after he had exited a startup uh, that was a drone company. He really wanted to focus on climate change and solving that energy problem. Um, and what we did was we spent years really focused on just interviewing people in the industry to understand why did nuclear have this huge scale up from you know starting off in the 60s with a few reactors to by the 1990s having a little over 400 and then just remaining flat through mm -hmm. the last 30 or so years. Uh, and what we learned was kind of that thesis that I articulated earlier that to reach economies of scale, the industry really exploded the projects, made them much, much larger, only could sell them to government and utilities. And when they did that, they really changed the incentive model for them. So if the government's buying something from you, you have really no incentive to lower the cost. The government's always going to pick up the tab. So they were always going over budget, going over timeline, always having to do just a little bit more, spend this much. And it was great for the people that were in the industry at the time. They made a lot of money, but it didn't help the industry grow. 
So we took a lot of that feedback from regulators, from operators, and decided to change our design on how we could build a power plant that solved really what we saw as the two key problems, it being delivered uh, on time and on budget. So really what we've done is actually design an entire power plant that is fully modular. So our entire power plant is encased in basically the size of shipping containers, these steel frames. Wow. We manufacture these in Texas where we actually incorporate all of the equipment. So steam turbines, the piping, the pumps, all of this is bolted onto these steel frames and there's about 70 of them. We build them in a manufacturing facility. And then if someone wants a power plant, we just ship all of these steel frames to the site and we can assemble that power plant in about less than six months. So that's wow. kind of our thesis. Um, you know, each one of our power plants is today pretty cost competitive to, you know, uh, a solar or a wind with battery storage. So if you need baseload carbon free power, we're able to deliver that, you know, in a timely manner. And really the only thing that's kind of slowing the timeline down is, is the regulatory process. Mm. But given our long history of working with the regulators and all of our markets and globally, we understand their pain points and what they care about. And we've taken a lot of that feedback and have it influenced our design. That's awesome. We'll have to take a, a field trip to y'all's. Yeah. Um... Y'all's. We do. It's actually in Houston, a little outside of Katy. Seriously? Yeah. Yeah. We, have, we have a nine module fit up uh, and we have frequently taken people out there, investors, uh, customers, government officials to kind of tour that facility. Wow. Uh, we would love to go. Works. Next time yeah. one of you guys is here, please let us know. <laughs> we definitely will. I think, I think it would be cool. There's a lot of, uh, it, we have that plus a, a couple other prototypes that we've kind of worked on to test our thesis. That's awesome. And when you said y'all scaled down, y'all scaled way down. That's really cool um, that it's like a shipping container yeah, rather so than a our, big our plant, reactor. Right. Our plant is is 20 megawatts. So, you know, uh, we like to call ourselves a micro nuclear power plant developer yeah. because there's a few people that say they're small modular reactors. And we found we were getting put in that bucket. But small for them is 300, 400 mm, megawatts. Mm -hmm. And we are very, very small compared to that at 20 yeah. megawatts. The benefit of that is, is that most, if you go to a manufacturing facility, they are probably consuming closer to 20 megawatts than they are 400 megawatts. So you can put these very close to you know, any type of manufacturing facility. We have term sheets with uh, chemical complexes, with steel manufacturers, with um, data centers where we can site this within you know 10 kilometers of their site mm -hmm. build a private wire directly into their site and then save the money on grid costs mm -hmm. and be able to deliver them consistent power do you have a favorite use case that y'all have done you know you guys brought this up at the beginning of the call the industry that we really see that shows the largest kind of where our value props really align is data centers so mm -hmm. What data centers are looking for is their customers are ultimately these IT providers, Amazon, Google, uh, Microsoft. And what those customers are demanding is that they want carbon-free power to be used in these data centers. And not only do they want that carbon-free power just on, you know, uh, total uh, nominal kind of match, but they want it time match. So every hour of every day, they want to know that the power that they're using is carbon free power. Mm -hmm. uh, and wind and solar can't deliver that. So solar obviously is only going to be producing in the middle of the day. Wind is producing whenever the wind is blowing, but nuclear can give that consistently all right. the time. And with data centers, they can't have any demand that falls off. They can't have right. power drop. So if they're looking to just add solar panels on their roof, that might give them that carbon free power that their customers are asking for, but then they'll need to figure out how am I going to find power during, you know, the nighttime when mm -hmm. people are still right. paying the data center to do searches, to do, you know, all the AI that we're seeing blow up. So we really feel like that is a great industry that we're targeting. Mm -hmm. We see a lot of development around that. That's awesome. And when you say 50 megawatts, is that per day? Uh, so I said 20 megawatts. Oh, 20. Uh, Sorry. And so the way to think about power is 20 megawatts is like the, the nameplate capacity. 
and then you will uh, take that 20 megawatts and that is per hour, you know, every day. Got uh, it. So our plant will produce over the course of a year uh, and, and given like a capacity factor, roughly around 165,000 megawatt hours is how that's measured. Okay. So, um, yeah, so for every day, you would see, you know, 20 times 24 would be the total megawatt hours. Got it. Th thank you for explaining that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no worries. Have you guys tapped into um, the mining space at all, Bitcoin mining? We haven't tapped too much in the Bitcoin mining space. I've had a few early conversations. Um, a, a lot of that has to deal with uh, just so the way our business model works is that we are going out and trying to sign PPAs very similar to what uh, solar wind mm -hmm. developers sign. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with what PPAs are, but that stands for power purchase agreement. Mm -hmm. So a industry like a data center or a um, metals manufacturer will say, I need this much power. I'm willing to sign a 10 12, 15, sometimes even 20, 25 year long contract wow. saying, I will buy this much at this price. And what solar and wind companies have done is they've taken that contract and used that as leverage to attract capital mm -hmm. to be able to build these assets. That makes so sense. They can go to investors and say, hey, I've got someone willing to pay mm -hmm. for the energy. We've already agreed on price. I've got you know a construction company willing to build this. This is what the cost is going to be. Now you can see what your cash flow is going to be is you the investor that you can get a portion of for your investment. Um, so we're leveraging that same model. Mm -hmm. So we go out and try to target these industries and get them to uh, commit to a PPA. With with Bitcoin mining, they want to, you know, get the cheapest energy possible and they yep. don't really need yeah. it to be baseload uh, because it's, a, you know, a large driver of their costs. We really don't see uh, that being a, a large industry for us, though obviously data centers are you know used in Bitcoin mining? Yeah. Uh, so uh, it, it's there's some crossover there, but yeah. not directly with Bitcoin mines. Yeah, I was interested in knowing that as well, um, just because it is so big right now in oil and gas and the intersection of Bitcoin mining. But that's because we have a ton of wasted gas yeah. that you can just use, <laughs> and there's honestly I don't know why you wouldn't do it, um, but it makes sense for y'all. Because there's not really wasted or anything that you're already producing mm -hmm. that you could just like, okay, I'll use the excess for this. That, that's right. Yeah. The the only thing that we are, uh, that I'd say would be similar is that we do produce a lot of heat that doesn't mm -hmm. always get converted to electricity. Mm. So there's what we call waste heat. Okay. Which we could use uh, to, for instance, to like heat a district heating network to prop to supply a city with like warm water or heating for their buildings. So that's, you know, particularly important uh, in markets that have long winters or very cold winters. They see a lot of value in that. Uh, and we can generate electricity and heat to be able to supply them. Two for one. How, mm -hmm. how does that work? Like, how do you distribute the heat? <laughs> That, this uh, so, might be a really stupid question again, but <laughs> no, no, not a, not a stupid question. Uh, it's so th there's basically these networks, of, it, and all it is is pipes. So oh, you know, in Texas, you guys are using uh, water heaters. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you have like a, whether it's gas or electric, some heating source that heats up the water uh, before at your like node where the water comes in, and then it distributes it through pipes in the house. So just imagine if you took that heat source and then put it somewhere else in a centralized location, made it very big and just transported the hot water Got the it. same way. Okay. That, that's okay. essentially what a district heating network is. Okay. That makes sense. Gotcha. I feel like mm. I'm my I feel like I keep learning about all these alternatives to oil and gas that aren't necessarily your traditional renewables like nuclear and geothermal. Mm -hmm. And I was telling them before we got here, I was like, I feel like this is going to be one of those episodes where I'm like, why aren't we doing more of this? It makes mm -hmm. complete sense. Yeah. And there's definitely a big push at the at the top down government level from local levels. Uh, and like I said, worldwide, where we see nuclear seeing a lot of interest. So I definitely think you'll begin to see it pop up more, especially at the end of this decade. If, mm -hmm. you know, all of our competitors and us develop good projects that uh, are able to attract further investment in future projects, you're going to see it ramp up and the costs come down and it become a larger uh, part of the generation mix. 
I agree. I think I see it a lot just mm-hmm. recently. Um, like I said, there's a nuclear TikTok. <laughs> and um, yeah. yeah, it's everyone's really interested mm-hmm. in it right now. I think that everyone's just waiting for a little bit more innovation mm-hmm. um, to drive the cost down. And then I think once that is solved, and it sounds like y'all solve that, um, mm-hmm. I think it'll yeah, be huge. Yeah, I mean, we're, we think that uh, as scaling down has made it to where we can deploy a little bit of capital, not as much as a gigawatt scale, and be mm-hmm. able to hit that cost uh, target and also hit the timeline target, which we think is just as important if you look at what happened to a lot of the reason the costs inflated for these projects is that they took so long yeah. that the financing charges for the loans they took out to be able to buy the equipment ended up eclipsing kind of the cost of the plant or becoming a large part of the cost. So um, that that's what we're focused on. And I definitely think we've got a pathway to do it. We're targeting 2026 for our first developments. So I think it'll be that it's just wait and see until then. Amazing. Awesome. I'm excited. Mm-hmm. Well, we'll definitely be following along and hopefully in the future, we'd love to, you know, keep having you guys on podcasts and like Julie mentioned, hopefully. Field trip. Yeah. Hopefully a <laughs> field, field trip. trip. Yeah. Field trip out to, to Katie. Actually, I, I live in Katie. Officially Brookshire, but yeah. Yeah. Is, I live right by yeah. there. So um, I'm down. <laughs> Perfect. We always uh, wrap episodes up with a few kind of rapid fire questions. So Misty, okay, you want to? Do the honor. Sure. Um, okay, John. What is the biggest misconception in energy? In energy. Mm-hmm. Uh, or you can say nuclear. Yeah, let's do that's easier. Okay. okay. Uh, I think the biggest misconception in nuclear is that it's unsafe, that mm-hmm. there's this kind of radioactive boogeyman. And I think as you drill down into nuclear, it, it is one of the most engineered nuclear uh, energy solutions. And it's incredibly safe, uh, mm-hmm. considering all the accidents and people that get hurt on, in oil and gas, mm-hmm. even in re- renewables. Uh, this one is definitely the safest energy source we have. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have a work-related embarrassing story? <laughs> this is the fun one. A work-related embarrassing We've had story. some really good ones okay. in the past. I I mean, I think when I first started, so I came from oil and gas, I had uh, a very kind of uh, high level sense of power, but just (laughs) stumbling through kind of how power markets work and how, um, you know, nuclear is different. I think I have I can't tell you how many times I've mixed up fusion and fission. Oh, (laughs) Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Uh, So um, just a, a little bit of that early on was a lot of learning for me. That's funny. Yeah, I could see that. Um, there and there's so much to oil and gas in in itself mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. yeah, you can't possibly. Yeah, know no everything. one wants to talk about like geology or porosity or any of that stuff. I learned through the first seven years of my career. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a whole, a whole new set of uh, technology. Yeah, exactly. If people want to connect with you guys or learn more, where can they go? Yeah, I mean, I think we've uh, obviously the lastenergy.com or website um, is, a, is a great resource uh, to just kind of understand what we're doing. We also have some podcasts, the Energy Impact podcast, uh, as well as Titans of Nuclear, where we've done, I think at this point, almost 500 episodes wow, across both amazing. of them, uh, interviewing people, not just in the nuclear space, the Titans of Nuclear is definitely focused on that, but uh, in the energy investing space, as well as just the broad energy regulatory markets. Uh, so any of those uh, podcasts would be great sources to just learn a little bit more. Awesome. I think uh, mm-hmm. our CEO, Colin, is going to be on Energy Impact. Okay, perfect. So I everyone actually that's... doing that interview, so I'll look forward to it. Oh, good. Awesome. <laughs> perfect. Yeah, so everyone will have to keep an eye out for that. Obviously, um, all of our listeners like and subscribe. We appreciate all the feedback. We were just at a the Image Conference, which is a geological geo science. Mm-hmm. Geo, geo, geo. Lots of rocks. <laughs> yeah. A lot of rocks, of rocks. Some dinosaur yeah. fossils. Um, <laughs> lots of and nerds. We heard a story that, <laughs> lots of nerds. We heard a story that uh, a CEO sent their intern our Seismic Energy 101 podcast because the intern wanted to learn more about Seismic. So I feel like we're 
one intern at a time making a difference. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> that's our new tackle. Yeah. Yeah. One intern at a time. One intern at a time. Um, but John, thank you again for joining us. And hopefully we'll get to meet you in person soon. Yeah, looking forward to it. All awesome. Right. Thank you.